Hello. Nice to see you all. How are we doing? Oh, good, good. It's Sunday, so we get to bless and restart our lives in so many ways. But I think you're going to start off with reading first, yes? Do you want to do it at the podium where you feel a little bit more comfortable? I think I'll stay here. Oh, if you that's stay okay. here? Okay, perfect. I'm going to put this down. Um, I thought I would read a, an excerpt of the book that um, talks about the meditation practice that I adopted in 2020, you know, enduring grief, stress, worry, doubt, um, and maybe a re-interpretation uh, of what it means to be an American right now. It felt like I needed, um, I needed access to something that was not human consolation. And so this practice um, became life-saving. I teach myself to meditate in the summer of 2020 because I am worried, bothered, hurting. The world, the people in it, seem to be feeling these things too. All of us, no matter who we are or what we revere, are wounded. Even the people I see as guilty of one thing or another, guilty of harm against the people I love and prize, guilty of harm against me, even they are hurting too. It is the national condition. How long will the violence, which is the symptom of this condition, persist? How long will we be robbed day after day, season after season, and no matter who we are, of the fullness of our lives? And so every day, or quite nearly, as a means of holding myself together, I sit in a black Adirondack chair at the base of an oak tree in my backyard in New Jersey, taking heart in what seems to be the undeterred industry of birds, foxes, and squirrels. Even these trees seem to move with certainty through the work of each season. It helps me seeing that other living things still know what to do, that the terms of their lives remain clear to them even as so many of the terms that have long governed human life feel suddenly insufficient to the time now at hand. And so this practice of sitting, meditating, becomes a form of ceremony. I burn a bundle of white sage or cedar. I seek to slow and deepen my breathing. When I close my eyes, it isn't absence or silence that I find the goal of some forms of meditation I've read about, but images, figures, and symbols in my mind's eye, and words in my mind's ear. Am I imagining things? I may be. The imagination is the capacity by which we measure what is or what ought to be possible. Is peace possible? A moment of ease in a disastrous year? The imagination is an engine of creation. It supplies the terms of our longing, our wishes, appetites, and needs. By perceiving what is missing and then exerting the creative effort to fill that lack, what do I long for? What do I believe myself to lack? One thing driving me to this right is the desire to no longer be alone the need to no longer simply call out, but to be answered back, no matter what the message might reveal. And not by the human chorus that is always on, everywhere, singing judgment, indignation, and fear. I have lived a long time tuned to that. I have bolstered it and heeded it. I have added my voice to its ranks. I have, and so have you. Look where it has left us, singed by rage, run aground in the shallow banks of our own panicked voices, queasy from our treacle of virtue, all the empty phrases we've been taught to repeat, all the flimsy notions by which we seek to convince ourselves we're large, all the easy gestures promising to absolve us of wrong, 
what we click, like, admit to in the depthless expanse of a screen. GIFs, comments, memes. I want instead the opposite of this nonsense. So I will start off by saying that I had a few good cries with this book. Um, and I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful to the Chicago Humanities Festival for inviting me to do this conversation with you. The last time I saw you, actually, you were being inducted as our 22nd US Poet Laureate. And Amanda Gorman. <laughs> Amanda, Amanda Gorman was being inducted as the Youth Port Laureate. So it was like I was in DC, you sent a special invitation to me. And so that was the last time I think we saw each other. So that was like the before times, right? 2017, <laughs> the world was different then. Before and after. But here we are. And so I want to kind of get into the thick of this book. and. So many people know you as a poet. And this work reaches, I think, across genres of writing. While I was reading, I kept thinking, well, she can't quit the poet. She just can't. Because so many things are a poet in this book. Can you talk about writing a work that reaches across genres? and what it felt like for you as a writer, and now a historian. Um, that's such a generous question. <laughs> um, I feel like genre is a tool with which we do the larger work of language. And I didn't always feel that way. I was, in, um, I was educated in a program, an MFA program in the 90s where you were committed to a genre and you didn't deviate from it. And I thought that was like sort of about calling, but it was about administrating a program. <laughs> if I wanted to you know, take a seat in another genre workshop, it would throw things off. And so it took me years to realize language is, is my tool. And um, at that point I started venturing out. You know, I wrote the first memoir um, and have dabbled in other, other forms. And so I thought with this book, because it's a book of seeking, it, it's a book that emerges not out of certainty that I have answers, but that I have these questions that feel like they have to be shared. Um, and so thinking like a poet helped me to move associatively through time and through uh, topics or events that felt related to one another, even though they're separated by distance or, or other maybe logical you know, terms. And then prose helped me to believe there might be a narrative that could emerge. Um, and maybe that notion of narrative allowed me to bear witness to a lot of stories <laughs> from my life and from my family. Um, what I think I realize is um, we are all stewards of history. We are all stewards of the American narrative. And um, we all have to start thinking in more resourceful ways about what that means and, and how we might be of service to our survival. So we're gonna go into my next question, which I think you've already answered, but you might wanna talk a little bit more about because when I was reading this book, I was thinking about Alex Haley. I was thinking about Zora Neale Hurston and this idea of history, but the anthropology of history, if that makes sense to you all, like the lost bones of our people. And it's not just claiming a history, it's not just discovering. People discover things all the time. They don't always know what to do with it, and they don't always do the right thing by it. And so can you talk about the claiming of the histories that you found, which is your own history, the claiming of the histories that you found, 
and how it's led back to you and how you move forward in the world now. Yeah. Um, well, it takes me a little bit back to the meditation mm. because I was really asking for guidance and help. How do I, how do I even think about what, what I ought to be doing and how I ought to do that? Um, and I really do believe that ancestral voices and guides interceded. <laughs> Even my, you know, both of my parents passed away, my father um, more recently in 2008. And I am the child in my family who inherited all of the papers and military records and photographs and all of these things. And I felt like my father said, I'll help you. In fact, open this box that you've never opened before. Open this envelope, read this letter, and now look over here. And I feel like he showed me the real story of his life things that um, had to do with living in the 20th century as a head of a large household, uh, servicemen in the Air Force, um, and dealing with an extremely heavy responsibility um, and doing it silently and with such grace that his children had no idea the difficulty. Um, and then meandering through archival records, looking for just evidence of, of his family, our people, um, I found more. I found a letter that a neighbor um, of my grandparents had written to the governor of Alabama during the Great Depression. And it's a really courageous letter, and it's a letter where you can hear this man's voice. I describe almost being able to see his hand gestures because it's so full of the desire to be understood and heard. Um, and he's basically saying, all the colored people have been laid off from work. I just arrived today to learn that I too have been laid off, but I don't think we're being treated fairly. Um, many of us have large families to take care of, and he talks about the price of food, and um, he doesn't know where help is coming, but he asks that some be sent. And then he gets a letter back from the governor's representative that is maybe like the prototype for AI, <laughs> just so bloodless. Um, a sentence that leads almost through a labyrinth that arrives nowhere, basically. Um, and so I can just feel the limitations of care and also the wonderful resilience and inventiveness and improvisation by which communities of people may do, made a future possible for their, their you know, children and grandchildren and so forth. Um, I feel like I hold that in me now. I feel like those voices and those versions of truth um, help me make better sense of my own life, be it, you know, albeit different. And um, I just want to invite all of us to kind of like sit at the feet of these voices, which are often tucked away in corners of the archive if they even make it there, but they're full of what's missing from our view of who and what we are as a nation. Um, I, I want to make a big case in this book that these are quiet lives that are essential to this massive enterprise of, of liberation. That's perfect. Thank you. So in terms of talking about the quiet lives, there's one life in the book. I've honed in on a few different lives in the book, but Diego, your ex-husband, and on page 127, you talk about Diego's uh, a specific experience. And this was right after um, Trayvon Martin. And um, there was one line on that page that just has stuck with me for quite some time. Are you going to read it to me, or should I read it? OK. <laughs> I come prepared, y'all. The news of the decision does not come as a great surprise. And I thought, okay, let me just take that. And I actually wrote the line on my whiteboard in my office. The news of the decision does not come as a great surprise. And meanwhile, in the thick of it, you're talking about your ex-husband's experience in terms of just what he feels like he had to do 
And it was just a natural experience. It's a human experience of responding to black people. Mm -hmm. And then this thing happens between George Zimmerman and Trayvon Martin, who will forever be linked now. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what people don't actually think about. No matter what side you sit on, they are forever going to be linked. And so, is there anything surprising, given this work, of the world we're sitting in right now? Sadly, I don't think so. I mean, the hope would have been that clarity would have arrived through the generations of, of labor toward, um, toward liberation, toward teaching America how to see itself more honestly. Um, but look at us. <laughs> um, that little excerpt goes on to say, you know, the decision does not come as a surprise, not because it is correct, but because America has had centuries to learn the discounting of black lives. Um, and it's a lesson that's been taken to heart. It's a lesson that we're, we're struggling to intervene upon in a way. Um, even looking at that first marriage and seeing how my then husband, who was Mexican, and um, felt at a disadvantage in the American hierarchy, viewed blackness as a means of leverage for himself so that he wasn't at the very bottom of these many wrongs that we um, consent to. And that was, um, it felt important to bring those different lenses together. Right. I, this is a book in many ways about the American imagination. And I wanted to implicate myself right. as well, because in that dynamic, in that marriage, I too had a, a form of leverage. Um, unconsciously, perhaps, but um, being an American, being the person with the guarantee of earning power in this country and, and fluent in the language, um, and even understanding the dynamics of racism in a way that, you know, um, he didn't come quite as an outsider, that was a kind of power that I wielded. I wanted to, I wanted to put myself out there maybe it's an invitation to readers to say, okay, what do I do? Right. How do I see what is um, possible and advantageous to me? And what do I do in the face of what, what also feels immovable? Um, I think many of us are thinking, thinking about these questions and there's so many really hopeful um, movements and, and threads of, of activism and resistance, especially coming out of literary communities. Um, but we have to sit with this and metabolize it in some way, activate it in some way. Thank you. You know, many people, and especially through your work, uh, obviously, and with this work, we find so much about you and your family, but many people knew your father in a great and wonderful way him being this world-class engineer, working on the Hubble telescope, like all these different things. And so in this work, you know, I was trying to weave back and forth about, um, especially when we are in a time of like, burn down the patriarchal system. You've come from very, very important and loving and supporting men who've actually, in some way, shape, or form, raised up women. So can you talk a little bit about how you feel about like the matriarchs, the women in your family, and then the patriarchal system that is most families? That's a good question. Um... I felt like my last memoir spent a lot of time in my maternal family, and this was an opportunity, and with this new evidence that I had, to think about the other side of my family, which I don't know as well. Um, and 
thinking about what I learned about my father um, and realizing how vulnerable he was. Mm -hmm. You know, he was trained in the Air Force. He did work for about six years as a contractor on the Hubble project, which happened across the country. We were in California. Um, and then when that project ended, he was seeking work and had a really hard time because he didn't have a bachelor's degree. Um, and so to read the correspondence he wrote saying, I took all these you know, 20 years of classes in the Air Force, can these contribute at the very least to my AA degree? And knowing what I know about what that would still leave him out of, you know, having access to it broke my heart. Um, but I feel like that sense of humility and um, the desire to provide was really important. I think he descended from men like that. His father was a veteran of World War I, um, came back to Alabama as a farmer, raised 10 children. Um, I noticed around the time my dad graduated from high school, in the census records, his father had gone from being a farmer to being unable to work. And so I imagine that some of my father's decision making about going into the service might have had to do with, with needing to contribute to the family or wanting at least not to be a burden to the family. Um, and I also think about what bolstered him in those moments of d difficulty or defeat. He went to Detroit after high school looking for a job maybe in the auto industry and it didn't pan out. So he came back home and it was his mother, I know, who greeted him and lifted him back up. Um, as it was my mother, I know, who lifted my father back up after you know this difficult moment of having to start all over from scratch um, toward the end of his career. Um, I'm trying to find a way of marking love and care and nurturing in the archive. Um, and I think that's really what for me shapes the presence or the Im impact of the feminine lives that I descend from. Um, I also know that the vocabulary of faith came to me through my mother. We were a church going family, but she was the center of that. And she's the person who made faith feel powerful, not like a retreat from life, but a way of almost um, ascending the ranks towards something that might help you amplify the dimensions of your intention and your hope and your need. Yeah. Um, and so I feel like those are, those are different ways of making and sustaining. Thank you. I mean, it's kind of a roundabout way, you know, and especially learning so much obviously from your previous book about the, the women in your family, but learning more about your father. Um, and then he tried so hard because I think he wanted to be in some ways what you're living right now. And so it's, you know, the irony is, you know, he was like, I have all these credits towards getting somewhere. And then he, now he has a daughter that teaches at Harvard. Here we are. I'll say that I learned through the practice of gathering up my ancestors in meditation and also listening, trusting that they were guiding me through um, the asking and seeking that made this book happen. I know they're working with us. <laughs> I invite you to believe or admit that the generations that precede us, whose work is pivotal but ongoing or unfinished, are not off somewhere or gone. They're with us. They're asking us to, to move forward with, with this unfinished business. And I also believe that they've got a different perspective. <laughs> They're outside of the density of human wishes. And even people who might have been working against the good, I want to give them credit now for knowing better. Mm. Um, there's an anecdote at the very end of this book about a poetry reading that I gave in Kentucky during the laureateship. And I read from a number of Civil War poems, and they were really um, 
found poems, verbatim letters by black soldiers in the Civil War and their family members, verbatim lines from deposition statements given after the war in an attempt to claim the pensions that they were um, entitled to, but that many blacks were denied at that time because they didn't have the paper documents that um, emancipated or people who were, you know, whose freedom was considered inalienable from their very persons would have had. Um, and so this woman came up after, after that reading and she said, all those voices, they were so powerful and they reminded me of my beloved grandmother. Would you please wait for me? I just wanna go get something and I wanna give you something. She took a long time to get home in what was a, a pretty small town, but she eventually came back and she looked really worried. And I was like, what happened? And she said, my siblings and I love our grandmother so much that when she died or before she died and she lived to be in her 90s, we recorded her and we asked her to tell us stories and sing a lot of the songs that she knew and that she had sung to us when we were growing up. And I guess she had gone back home and listened to this recording that she wanted to give to me. And she said, my grandmother would never have wanted to hurt you. And I said, oh, of course. These old Kentucky songs, what do they have to say about me and my people? And I also thought, I have to give this woman credit. She could have stayed home. She came back and she kind of announced that this artifact exists and she now sees it and understands it differently. And in my mind, what I like to imagine is that her grandmother, just like my dad was like, go in that box, get that. Her grandmother said, go get that. And now think about it. I think it's time for us to tell different stories. Mm -hmm. And so I really believe that there's a dimension of the afterlife or whatever we want to construe it as that even is willing to change their value system because they now see the bigger picture. And so I want to summon that as an ally for us in doing what we have to do. That's so leading into my next question because I have so much to say about that. Um, what is so focused about, I think, all of your work but now I've really honed in with this particular work is not only the black experience, it's the absolute black experience and wait for it, you choosing not to blame anybody. I think that's an extraordinary thing to do as a writer. Now, we can blame people. We can spend all day bank blaming people. But you actually don't put blame. You just lay out the facts. You record your ancestors and you respond in the ways you feel is a human response. But you don't blame anybody. And so you're choosing not to blame any one race or history, and this speaks to what you just said here, but you show up with receipts. <laughs> receipts and our collective, no matter how divided we are, collective and brought, sold, oppressed histories they're all collective. We own it. We've all been bought and paid for to some extent. And so some people can't answer for ancestral pain or oppression or the monstrous. And what do you expect, expect for the black experience if and only if it is fully accepted as the absolute American experience. Hmm, I believe that's what it is. I know that's what it is. 
And I know that black life is full of love. When you belong, I'll use that word in many ways, to a country that does not love you, you create more love to share and sustain um, the, the people in your, your kin, your kith. Um, I feel like the archive, all the silence that we discern and now that we know how to name as, as violence, as uh, erasure, um, I think it's filled with love. I think endurance is love. I think um, discipline, even the silence by which my father kept some of those things from me, I know that was about wanting me to feel large. Um, and I think a big part of love is also forgiveness, um, grace. And that, you know, there are a lot of lessons America doesn't want to learn from us, but I wonder if that could be one. In order to, I mean, a lot of things have to happen in order to change. You have to realize that you, no matter how powerful you believe yourself to be, no matter how free you imagine you have always been, there comes a moment when maybe you're, you might be willing to realize you are captive in a system. You are captive in a system that demands that you wield your power and wield your freedom against others who you have been convinced are trying to take it from you. So that's, that's a lot of labor. Um, but what might it mean if you were willing to say, I forgive myself. I forgive myself for what I've done and what I've benefited from simply by my you know, birth. And now I wanna free myself to do some building or rebuilding. That's kind of what I'm hoping we might broach because we're so good at blaming each other. We're so good at um, building up a sense of righteousness and lev leveling judgment and doing it in pithy ways, doing it in, you know, like, little images on Instagram, but that doesn't really get us where we need to go. It just rigidifies the division and the, um, the fury that's keeping us, you know, stuck. So I have this wish that um, we could exercise a different kind of care toward ourselves if we haven't been taught to do that and then understand how, how much our care and, and contribution is needed elsewhere. That's so perfect, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so I'm gonna shift a little bit and I'm doing self-care right now. My bedroom is turning into a spa, just to let you all know. <laughs> I recommend that for all of you all. Turn some part of your house into like a spa. You don't have to get a gift card, you don't have to spend money, spa yourself. But I want to close out and ask a writer question because I've been struggling as a writer. You know, you are a writer, you're also an administrator, you're also a professor, you moved from Princeton to Harvard, the whole world, just stuff. So I have a writer question for you. Are you a proactive or reactive writer? So much of our lived experiences now come from the immediacy of the world. As writers, we no longer have the privilege to be asked to respond. We are forced to respond. Completely different things completely different ways of writing. Are you a proactive or reactive writer? Are they one in the same? If not, do you give different space, skin, pen when you decide to choose your words? That is a really complicated question. <laughs> I started this book 
to save my life, to make a different kind of sense of what I was in the midst of, in the thick of. And I think that's why it's so willing to do what we don't usually do, especially like in the academy. <laughs> um, and to, to talk about the soul, um, to de deviate from all the logics that I learned as a good student and to say they're, they're too small. Um, I think that was proactive. I feel like it was trying to build something that could sustain me. Um, and then the work of that began to feel like maybe this could be useful to us or, or different us's. Um, and so I felt willing to imagine that this could be a work that could um, enter into not just the space of private need, but um, a conversation with others, other people whose um, vocabularies and, and practices are different. Um, wanting to be of use to a world, that feels reactive to me, but I don't, I mean, Oftentimes I use the word reactive and it's, there's judgment in it, you know? Oh, you're just reacting, that's reaction, you know? But I think it, it felt like a response to what ought to have been an all hands on deck kind of call. I think of that Amiri Baraka poem, SOS, calling all black people, calling all black people. Um, come in, come on in, <laughs> you know, like just, I, I think of that as like APB, like no matter what beef we got, we got to get together and try and be and do. And that's kind of the call I felt like in some ways I wanted to be useful to. I don't know if that is responding in the spirit of your question. No, it's a perfect response because I think it takes it back to what this book culminates in so many ways because it's both proactive and reactive. Now, the proactive is that you searched, you seeked out this history, and then it's the reactive. You had to react to it. You decided to make this book. The proactive is finding things about your history, good, bad, the other. What is gonna be the reactive response? We live in this world now where we're just on rotation, a 24-hour news cycle and rotation and where it's so much you don't even get to absorb the information that you have, but you're being tasked to respond. I think this is actually between, and I had another question, but we don't have time for my questions because we're gonna move on to your questions. But I actually wrote down my favorite words in the book. And so, let me see. My favorite words are Alabama, <laughs> empire, census, logic, queasy, California. And I thought, well, I could use that word for everything that's happening in this moment, and then I can take that word back and be nostalgic about it maybe write some kind of history about it. But those words, I kept seeing those words, and it was like almost this map to you. So you answered the question beautifully, and I, I just think that proactive, reactive, I'm, I'm asking all writers this, so it's not just you, so I didn't want to put you on the spot. But I just feel like, who, who do we want to be as writers going forward? And how reactive do we have to be? Or can we, I'm used to settling my thoughts before I write something down. It used to be a ritual. It's not a ritual, excuse me. It's a call to action. And 
so it's a different it's a different space, and mm -hmm. so I just feel like we're living in different spaces that yeah. are closing in the walls of being I think a writer. We, yeah, but I think we actually can do something about that, and we have to, because when you're called upon to respond to something you're also being invited into an institutional view and vocabulary. You're being invited into a form. Comment on this for this, um, you know, this segment or this section. And so you're actually being um, asked to adapt. I think usually it, it means get smaller and rougher. And I've begun to say no. Hmm. Um, not out of initial righteousness, but to see what happens to the thinking I want to invite people into, which is about complication and, and trying to make things larger so we can move around within them, and to see how style impose a rigidity um, and a confidence that feels almost smug. I'm less and less willing to submit to that, depending on you know how much how much my, my will can be um, heated in that process. And so I wonder if that means we're going to make spaces for the real gifts of our you know, craft and our imagination to be waited for. Why? To say, stop making everybody spin their little wheels and circle in this whirlpool of the news cycle, which is repetitive and um, unoriginal and oftentimes constrained by institutional perspectives. Um, maybe we can we can say that this is not the ecosystem that we are um, willing to work in anymore. Boom. <laughs> Questions. <laughs> All righty, folks. If you have a question, please raise your hand nice and high, and we will bring a mic to you. Please keep your questions brief and keep them to questions only. You are invited to stand and give your name if you wish to. Oh, there we are. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. We got one down in front. First, I want to thank you for just the beautiful reading and thoughts and sort of reframing of how to experience the world. I, I feel like I'm meditated throughout, but um, I'm struck by the idea of being stewards. I, I can't remember if you said stewards of history or stewards of our narratives. And I wonder as a teacher at an institution, um, how you think about opening spaces for your students to be stewards of a broader narrative rather than a more limiting one that seems often to be what we're seeing nowadays. I have learned a lot from my students in this respect. Um, my first year at Harvard, I joined the faculty in 2021. And so that spring, I taught a a documentary poetry workshop. And I taught that because my practice has become more and more invested in archival materials. And my students who come to poetry, um, oftentimes as people who are majoring or concentrating in other disciplines, but who know poems can help them investigate their commitments differently, they bring so many questions of conscience with them. So many of them wanted to go to sites of historical injustice and places where they wanted to um, bring forward voices that we haven't yet heard. And a student of mine um, asked, where is the space for joy in the archive? Because it was getting pretty heavy. And I have been thinking about that ever since. And you know, we, we have to listen for that. We have to intuit that sometimes. We have to bring it in from other sources, sites, even living sites, because we too are the archive. And that, I think, was a charge that I brought with me into building this book. Because it's, you know, it is the, 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 the heaviness of history. We, we know what that looks and feels like. And oftentimes that's all we really are asked to think about. But these lives, these forms of care, the laughter that we know is also in the archive, especially in the midst of sorrow. Um, that's something that I think my student really 
instilled in me as something that I ought to be looking toward as well. And so listening to them has made my teaching, I think, just more fulfilling. Um, and I think that's like a good MO <laughs> moving forward. I have questions. My classes are often built around my questions or my theories about traditions. And then we have conversations that amplify everybody's view of those things. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Appreciate your comments. I'm, uh, I'm curious uh, about what advice you would offer to those of us who may not have the same degree of sensitivity or alacrity that you have with words on how to use language better as we talk with one another. Because it seems to me there's so much uh, bickering, uh, so much uh, anger uh, in many of the words, and they get tossed around so abusively and randomly that we may even be unaware that we're destroying ourselves? Oh, what a great question. Um, I think that we, we, we've received a lot of language um, and mo we've been sort of pushed into certain modes. And my theory is that this is an extension of the marketplace and even the confidence and certainty with which we are asked instantly to assess and rate and rank, to defend our opinions and positions, I think that's kind of driven by the market as well. Um, and it comes back at us in so many different ways. It comes back at us even in the, uh, the predictive text <laughs> on your phone or your email, which flattens, compresses. Um, and, and sometimes feels aggressive. Um, and so my first bit of advice is to remove yourself from that environment, to say, all those sound bites, I'm going to evacuate my mind of them. <laughs> all those shortcuts, all the received um, bits of logic, I'm gonna try and liberate myself from them and think fresh, afresh. Um, and then I think, you know, in conversation with others, it's hard to do this sometimes, but um, the practice that comes from certain therapeutic sessions, like where you, you listen to someone and then you say, I hear you saying, and you repeat back to them, you're putting those words in your mouth, in your body and you're processing them as if they belong to you. And then something is shared in that space. I think it tempers what you might be moved to say and think next. And I think those are strategies that certainly are helpful for me with like those difficult conversations, even raising children. <laughs> Sometimes I have to say, just go back to the therapeutic model. Um, <laughs> And I feel like that's great, but you know, it doesn't happen on the news because it takes too long and it messes everything up because suddenly there's not a side that we can be gunning toward. Um, but I think those are some things we must begin to insist upon. I really love um, an old essay by George Orwell called Politics and the English Language. And in it, he talks about how the degradation of English, of the language we live in, by the marketplace and by, you know, he doesn't call it the news cycle, but propaganda, all of this stuff degrades our thought process and it's a downward spiral. Our degraded thoughts turn toward this deadened language and I think we're in that, that rut right now, but it's reversible. And I would just say, Google that essay <laughs> and um, talk about it with someone. And, and, and maybe decide that you're gonna start building a different vocabulary. All right, we have time for one more question. As a reminder, folks, there will be a book signing at the end of this program out in the lobby of To Free the Captives, A Plea for the American Soul. Also a reminder, patrons, after the last question, please remain seated until our speakers have exited. And here's our last question. Hi, um, my name's Daryl Thompson, and um, in our family, we have a family reunion every couple years, and I'm tasked with doing a family history. And 
in Ancestry.com, we have the family tree, which is over probably 500 people in it. And it's gotten to the point where it's kind of got, gotten sort of incomprehensible. And I don't know quite how to convey meaning of community to the younger generations so that they'll understand, well, why are we in the same room together at this reunion? And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, I understand, because I come from big families on both sides. And even in doing research, I found you know, like my dad's grandfather on family trees of like third or fourth cousins. And their name for him was different than my dad's name for him. And so you suddenly think, well, how do we know, how are we in the same, who, you know, you start thinking proprietarily <laughs> about family. Um, I, in the year before my dad passed, I d interviewed him and just recorded it. It was, I was invited to write a monologue for the series where writers wrote in the, the voice of their father, so I interviewed him. And um, I turned back to some of those memories in, in building the portrait of him that lives in this book. And then in, in trying to think a little bit about the texture of his life and the family that he belonged to, I talked to his brother, who's 91, my uncle Richmond, and he told me a lot, he gave me a sense of the you know, like almost the smells and the, just the, the feeling, the rhythm of life in their family. And I wonder if little things like that, you know, are there old, older um, family members who you could talk to and get a little portrait of time and life that could go, you know, I don't know if there's a place to put it on the tree, but into the, the, the family history that you're producing for the reunions and for your family members that brings something to life. There's a little story in, in my book that my, uh, my great uncle who lived to be 101, he died on his 101st birthday, had told me uh, probably, I don't know, when he was in his late 90s, and it was simple. But when he was a little boy, his, grand, his parents would put him on a horse, a gentle old horse that knew how to get to his grandparents' house. And it would walk him up the road or however far where they, they would greet him. And I don't know, that just fills my heart. I tell that story in the book as a way of thinking how we hold one another, we call to one another, and we, we um, repeat in some ways. And so maybe even just little bits of, I think of them as like gold, <laughs> like that could almost function like a campfire that the family would wish to gather around. So I do want to say, and thank you for that question, because my parents are so into gene genealogy, and it's been kind of like a thing. It's like a wonderful thing, but it's like, what am I supposed to do with all these people that have just, <laughs> what am I supposed to do with those leaves? You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> so here we are, but I'm so grateful for you. Oh, I'm you. so grateful for you. <laughs> and. I want to close this out because this is the second time CHF has asked me to do something. I did something for Alice Walker in 2018. And so I opened with a poem for her. And so I'm going to close with a poem for you that I got up at 5 o'clock this morning to draft. And we'll see if it sorts itself out. So it's called Scab. Everything I pick at picked apart all the things I won't let heal. It grows larger. That scar, now in the sweet spot of my body, where the curve of a woman gets serious. I pick, like picking cotton or some forbidden fruit, life, circumstance. Because picking satisfies for the moment. That itch, that first bleed, that only other reason to feel in this life. Survival, insurance, that we will finally be human to one another. We keep picking. Something as simple as a pimple Something as simple as a paperclip. Something 
as big as a history. We pick. How much do we pick out our wounds? How much do we allow them to heal? Thank you. Thank you.